topological insulators. That's certainly an odd combination of words. I have to say that after having worked in this field for a number of years, I still find it kind of jarring, almost alarming, to see those two words lined up against each other in the same sentence. Um, so one of my tasks today is to tell you what a topological insulator is, how, how they were discovered, and, uh, um, and where it is they may be leading us. The prediction of topological insulators grew out of some work here at Penn, as was just mentioned, with my longtime Penn colleague, Charlie Kane, and was recognized this year with the Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics. But truth be told, the basic ideas behind the subject way predate our own work on it. They have a very long history, and I want to actually tell you about some of that history because it'll let you appreciate what these things actually are and why they might be useful. So uh, if the word topological insulators is hard to look at, let me uh, do a more palatable one. Uh, our graphics department has put this together. I think it uh, ver very beautifully captures the subject. The graphic in the center, mind the gap, is taken from the London tube, and it's been overlaid on a graph from uh, one of our early research papers on the subject. And that's also an unlikely combination, but really it works. The key to understanding a topological insulator is to pay attention to the warning on the mind, uh, uh, on the, mind the gap sign. So I know that this conference is an invitation to think big, and to start, I think, the biggest think that I can lead you toward is to give you a summary of the entire subject, not just of topological insulators, but of all of physics. Um, that sounds like a daunting task, but in fact, the heavy lifting has already been done for us. So let me just point you to this graphic which beautifully summarizes this. Okay. This is by Dominic Wallerman, who's a trained physicist and also quite a skilled gra graphic artist. And he lays this out in, a, 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 in the style of one of these like beautiful historical tapestries. You know, far to the left there, we've got Newton, laws of motion. We've got Maxwell, laws of electrodynamics. And then historically, this is followed in the middle of the tapestry by the great revolutions of the 20th century. You know, relativity, which changes our concepts of space and time, and quantum physics, which is the laws of very small things on very small length scales. Uh, an important statement to make is that in a century that saw that kind of revolutionary thinking, perhaps the most impactful for us is actually this thing shown in the lower left. It's condensed matter physics. Uh, condensed matter physics, broadly speaking, one of its primary tasks is to take the understanding from quantum physics and apply it to have a deep understanding of materials and how you can build them and use them for practical purposes. For example, the outgrowth of this uh, discipline is what enables the action of your computers, of your cell phones. It probably ran the uh, GPS that brought you here today and the laser scanner that got you in the door. Okay. That kind of connection of quantum physics with real world applications is sometimes called the first quantum revolution. The idea of topological insulators belongs in this sector, but it's part of the second quantum, uh, quantum um, um, revolution. It's finding new materials that can do these kinds of things more efficiently and perhaps lead us to new designs we haven't yet imagined. So I've been asked a lot to describe topological insulators over the last few years in the many interviews and discussions that I've had. I find the same questions are always coming up. Let me just walk you through the questions. First of all, what is a topological insulator? Or the variant, what could be topological about insulators? Okay. Or, uh, more broadly, what is topology? Okay. Or, as Mark Zuckerberg put it to us at a laureate's lunch last fall, he asked the question, what is an insulator? <laughs> now, likely unknown to Mark, quite possibly, uh, what he was asking is a very deep and profound question. That is the question. Uh, in fact, that question, I will tell you, does not have an answer that is both simple and correct. And so what I'm going to do is to back off from that a little bit and talk first about the easier question to handle, which is what is topology? Okay. So what is topology? Well, according to the Wikipedia, it's a branch of mathematics. It involves properties of space that are preserved under smooth deformations, things like stretching, bending, twisting, and crumpling. You can't tear and you can't glue. That's interesting in its own right, but it's not going to be allowed for the purposes of this talk. Um, now, uh, I'll explain this by way of example. So in math, uh, an example would be, you know, you take a sphere, you could squash it smoothly, make it into a disk. Those two are the same. You can smoothly deform one into the other, but you can't smoothly deform the disk into the loop-shaped object on the right. That involves tearing it open, 
and re-gluing it, and so that's not allowed. This is a very general and generic idea. It occurs in mathematics, but it also occurs in many other uh, environments. For example, uh, it could occur in nutrition. Okay. <laughs> so in nutrition, you would say that by this thinking, an orange could be smoothly deformed into a cookie, uh, modulo the, you know, the, trans, the, the transmogrification of the sugars and so forth. But there's no amount of changing ingredients that'll turn the cookie into a donut. That's not allowed because you really have to poke a hole in it. So what I usually like to point out is that if you have children in the house, make sure they don't learn too much mathematics because they will try to convince you that the middle panel is the same as the left, okay, and they would be right, okay. So with that input, let's now turn to Mark's question. What is an insulator? And again, I'll start by doing it by way of example. So here's just like a classic experiment. You take a battery, a light bulb, some wires, a nail on one side, a pencil on the other. When you wire this up, the light bulb lights on the left. And what happens on the right is that nothing happens. So the current goes through one, the, uh, uh, the conductor on the left, and not the, uh, and not the insulator on the right. Okay, so that gives a possible answer to a Zuckerberg's question. What is an insulator? You might say the answer is, an insulator is not a conductor. Okay, so sadly, that is not a definition because I learned early on you don't define a thing in terms of what it is not. Uh, but sadder still, it reflects a fundamental prejudice, which I would say is, was the law of the land until about 10 years ago. The prejudice is that the things that are useful are conductors. If you want to transmit energy, signals, information, conductors are the important things, and insulators will ultimately play a secondary role. And that is a universal idea that has a long history, in fact, a long history in this university. It goes back, for example, to the work of Benjamin Franklin on just this subject. You know, he studied it and realized in his treatise that one had to distinguish between conductive and insulating states of matter, and he describes it in this passage that I won't read to you, but I'll tell you that he calls conductors non-electrics and he calls insulators electrics. And he reaches the same conclusion, that the interesting thing is the non-electric. Uh, those are the things that are useful if you want to move what he's calling here the electrical fire. Yeah, the, um, this same idea appears in the modern, modern first quantum revolution formulation of this problem. And I'll tell you a little bit about uh, uh, a little bit how it works. This goes back to work in the, uh, in the mid 60s by Walter Cohn. One thing you need to appreciate is that in quantum mechanics, Electrons, they're waves. And the energy of the wave depends on how much you squeeze it. The more you squeeze, the energy can change quite a lot. That's shown by that curve going up steeply uh, on the left. But the important thing is that even when you don't squeeze it at all, when you sort of make it spread out, what'll happen is that there's still a residual energy in the problem. And roughly speaking, that energy is the energy it takes to dislodge electrons from the atoms to get them move freely as waves in a material. Um, the cartoon to keep in your head is something like this over on the right. There are electrons that are bound in orbits on the atoms. You kick them with a little bit of energy, and then they move throughout the crystal. You need to have that energy to remove them. And that kind of situation is called a nearsighted behavior. Electrons bound on any one of those sites know nothing about remote potentials, boundaries. It all doesn't matter. They only know where they are. Um, until about 10 years ago, that was the law of the land. We felt that that was the universal defining characteristic of the insulating state. So the answer to Zuckerberg would be that in the insulating state, you don't really have anything going on. It's completely inert. The postmodern thinking says that actually misses something important. Okay. We're now in the 21st century, and what we now realize is that insulators of that sort actually have a kind of internal DNA. They know something about the medium in which they have been embedded, and that is actually characterized in terms of topological invariance. So we're now in a position to connect these two disconnected ideas. What is topological about insulators? Okay. Well, it's in this DNA. Okay. Here's the, here's the, here's the, uh, the refined uh, uh, definition. Insulators are topologically equivalent if they can be smoothly deformed into each other, and they're topologically distinct if they cannot. Okay. So that admits the possibility that these things are not inert. There are actually different kinds of them, different species of insulator, and one has to, you know, one has to take careful, uh, careful track of, of, of this. Let's describe how this works in a graph. Okay. So here's the, here's the squeezing to the right, the energy changing as a function of the squeeze. If you look very closely to the origin there, you see the curve on the right. Now, the steepness of those curves gives you the velocity of the propagation of the wave, the walking men, to the right on the right, to the left on the left. 
That is the grossest of gross understatements, okay? A better statement would be something like that. The motion is extremely rapid. You know, how rapid? It's roughly one one hundredth of the speed of light. That's the intrinsic speed in one of these things. A better graphic would be to have the man disappear altogether, okay? So they're here now and gone in a moment. But a thing to, but a thing to realize is that there's places on the curve where there's no slope, there's no steepness, and that corresponds to what I'll call the standing man, the standing state. Now here's the key concept. A standing state, a standing man, is not, in quantum mechanics, a man with no motion, okay? That's the important idea, okay? The standing state is actually, you know, waves do what waves do. They run through each other, they superpose. The standing state is actually a combination of the forward and, mover, forward and backward moving, you know, states of the system. This is the only equation that will appear in the talk, and so I'll just walk you through it for how to read it. What you say is that when you have the standing state, the chance of moving forward is the square of the coefficient that precedes it. One over root two squared is one half. Chance one half moving forward. The chance of moving backward is one over root two squared, one half, but there's two ways of getting a number that will square to a half. They differ by a sign. There are two different ways to superpose the states they correspond to two really different insulating states that cannot possibly smoothly be deformed into each other. To understand them, you need to pay attention to the London tube warning and mind the gap. The gap contains the DNA. It's the signature of how you have different, um, different insulating states. One more graph to see how that works. Here's these two insulating states. In one case, we have a positive parameter there. In one case, negative. Here are the labels positive, negative, positive. You'll see that you can't possibly take the thing on the left and turn it into the thing on the right because a number that is positive taken to a number that is negative will somewhere go through zero. And if it goes through zero, that happens. There is no gap. It's actually a conductor. Not only a conductor, there's no place where it's flat. That means there's never any turning around in that state. You can't get the particles to turn around in the special state in between two different insulating states. Okay, it's either all forward or all backward and no turning around. So there, are, so there are three fundamental ideas. Two, in this case two, in some cases many different insulating states, boundaries between them are always conducting and they always have this special no turning around property. That makes this a hugely useful idea to see why. Okay, I'll just point out that in an ordinary conductor, turning around generates a little bit of heat. Okay, now, um, uh, you know, for example, that's a fact. If you run the current through the nail, it heats up. If you have your laptop running on your lap, it's not only a laptop computer, it's a lap warmer. Okay, okay there's heat being generated. But if, you don't turn, but if you don't turn things around, there's no, or at least much less heat. Okay, so what's the velocity in an ordinary, you know, in an ordinary, ordinary conductor? Let me sort of bring up a graphic, again from the tube, to describe this. This was taken last December during one of the many tube strikes and this is a picture of one of the station stops on one of the lines that was actually running. And you see lots of people. The people are metaphors for electrons, and in fact, their motion is limited by their collisions with other people. It's very slow. Uh, in a current carrying state in a typical, typical conductor, what's the typical velocity of the charges? I'll move my finger across the room at the typical velocity. Okay. So from the back of the room, you, at the back of the room, you can't see that. In the front of the room, you couldn't see it either. Okay, okay, it's a very, very slow velocity limited by collisions. That's the situation in an ordinary current carrying conductor. Now imagine replacing that by this, okay? That's the tube when it's working, okay? One-way motion, very efficient, no turning around at sec except at the places where you want it, okay? Like at the station stops. So does that actually happen? Yes. If it can, where can I find it? Well, as it turns out, it's not particularly rare. We now, we now know the recipe for looking for these kinds of things, and there are many, many examples of this kind of thing in nature. Uh, in the theme of this conference and connecting disconnected concepts, I would say in this case, you have many situations where you have materials that are insulating on the interior and conductors on the boundary and a third and, and the boundary conductor is special. When you do that, you don't turn, don't turn, don't turn charges around and don't dissipate much energy. There's many examples, I'll just flash two. Uh, we predicted this for two-dimensional graphene back in 2005. Actually, the details of this have been observed uh, quite recently, published uh, just last month. 
But in the, in the intervening time, we found that this is possible in many, many three-dimensional crystals. The, uh, the data on the left there actually shows an experimental verification of the uh, crossing, of the crossing of those two states, the band closure exactly at the, uh, at the boundary with a no turning around rule. Okay. So the field has developed rapidly over the last you know, 14 years or so. In the early days, we sort of had the field to ourselves. It was an interesting but a quiet time by any reasonable measure. And these days, we are being overwhelmed by the bounty from the uh, many people who are exploring this and other opportunities to exploit uh, these ideas. So where will this lead us? Well, let me br uh, bring up another Wallerman. Uh, it is not hard to point to situations in our daily life that are being thoroughly penetrated by the output of the first quantum revolution. You know, computers, cell phones, efficient lighting and LEDs, digital cameras, those kinds of things. I should point out that every one of, the, one of those devices involves charge motion in the slow mode. We're now talking about replacing that by very efficient transport of charge. Um, so I think one can imagine that. More optimistically, you might imagine really a whole new generation of materials based on these new systems. So where will this lead? I don't really know for sure, but I can give a bit of advice. The advice is keep calm and mind the gap. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>